supplements. Uh, you hear about them all the time in the health and fitness space. It's where you probably see most of the information being pointed to. You see a lot of ads. In today's episode, we're going to talk about the best supplements you can take for a lot of different goals. In fact, we rank them and we categorize them. And you know us, we're not full of crap. We're going to be honest. So today's episode, we're going to talk all about supplements. All right. So I think we should open and start by talking about how supplements are a complete waste of time if you're not looking at your exercise and activity, your diet, and your sleep. sleep. Yep. If you don't, if those things suck, then you're essentially taking a thimble of water and throwing on a house fire. It's not going to do anything. You're mm -hmm. you're 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 not helping yourself. The only all. the only challenge I or the only way I would challenge that is, and I because I 100% agree. In fact, I remember first talking about the Honda. Uh, putting a spoiler on a Honda Civic, right? It's kind of the similar analogy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but where I do think it could make a, a big, big difference is if you have a, a deficiency. That's that's different. Yeah. So and we'll get there for sure. Yeah. So there is there is that part, right? Like, and I, and I think that matters. The most, and I, my views on supplements in in general have completely changed in during my journey in the fitness space for as long as I've been in it. And you know, of course, as a young kid, I was overly excited about it. And then realized how little it had to do with our results and then completely dismissed it. And then the more I got into understanding like micronutrients and how a lot of these foods and things that we, many people are commonly deficient in, mm -hmm. uh, relate to different operating systems in your body that could result in some of the bigger res uh, rocks being improved. I now realize looking back, like, okay, there's obviously a place for supplements, both on the you know, performance and cutting edge and like after you've checked all the main boxes. And then there's also a place for it where you are deficient, where I think it could really make a difference. Yeah. I think that the, 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 if you look at the space, it's a little, it's actually a lot distorted because the space, like any space, right? Like any market is driven by uh, profits. It has to be, otherwise mm -hmm. it wouldn't exist. Mm -hmm. But the problem with that is the most profitable segments of the market are going to get the most attention and information that's going to be put out, right? So if there's something that is profitable, people who move into our space who have to, who want to communicate around health and fitness, there's a strong incentive to communicate more or distorted information in the sense that it's going to make it look like supplements are more important than they are because mm -hmm. they're, they're so profitable. Mm -hmm. So they're going to overhype it. it yes, because it's 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 hard to profit or make a living in the fitness and health space without selling products, without selling supplements. So it so to the consumer, when they look at in, you know the space, when they listen to podcasts, when they watch YouTube videos, when they look go to social media, it's the information is going to make it look like supplements are a bigger piece of the pie. Like they're really important, but they're not in the context of, um, of the whole picture. Of course, nutrient deficiencies are a totally different thing. We'll get there. But if you don't have a nutrient deficiency, then they don't make up. And especially if you're not exercising, eating right and getting good sleep, it's like a waste of, it's a waste of time, but I can see why people are confused. I mean, as a kid, mm -hmm. when I was a kid, we didn't have the internet, or at least we didn't have the internet, um, like we do now. So if I wanted information on fitness or muscle building or fat loss, I went to the, the magazines and it was, you know, flex magazine and muscle and fitness and Iron Man and muscle mag and all those magazines. And those magazines, I mean, they made money through selling magazines, but they made way more money selling ad space and supplements. So when I went through and read it, I was under the impression that supplements were a big, big game changer. Yeah. And I spent a lot of money on supplements and a lot of time taking different supplements. And my expectations were always really high and I was always disappointed with supplements. Yeah, well, I think too, like a lot of these companies found out like certain hacks of getting people's attention, especially with the transformation pictures. And it was like, there was nothing attached to the work or what they were eating nutritionally or anything else that they're doing in their everyday life. It was like, I started taking this and look at this dramatic transformation. Yeah. And then it was just like, that was the end of the conversation. And so it's easy for you to just be like, wow, look how powerful that supplement is in terms of like what my goal is and how I can get there. This was some, one of the things uh, that connected us. Yeah. When we first, well, before we started uh, the podcast, the business at all, um, part of my personal motivation of, 
turning on the social media platforms that I did to build a potential business or brand um, was to actually to call this out that this has been this has been the way to make money in fitness for a very long time. It is get famous, whether that be through you know bodybuilding, television, magazines, uh, now social media. Once you garner enough attention, then you partner with a supplement company or you create your own supplement line or affiliate with several different supplement companies and you peddle that and you make commission off of that. That has been the way to make a lot of money in the industry. And yet I recalled all the years and hundreds and hundreds of people that I trained and could not, not one client that I ever trained that, oh, because I put them on these supplements, they had this transformation. So when I started to document my transformation process, part of what I was constantly communicating was that I'm not taking any supplements. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't need any supplements to, to do this, to get in this incredible shape, and no, neither do most of you. And when we all first got together, it was one of the things that we all found most in common was that we were really turned off by this was the the formula and it wasn't that we were dismissing that these things yeah. have some value or that there are certain conditions it's mm -hmm. just that that was the prevalent message in the yeah. space was take supplements and look you like this some counterbalance yeah. in terms of how we saw it because it was way oversold way overhyped it's it's also the most um dishonest part of the of the industry i mean i remember learning and i learned this from an industry insider uh, when I was in my twenties, I learned that they would go to bodybuilders in peak shape. So ripped, shredded, pumped, and they would take a picture of them. And then they would tell the bodybuilder to get out of shape. And then they would take a picture of them. So in other words, eat a bunch of garbage and crap, stop working out. And they paid them a lot of money to do this. And then they would make that the before picture. So they'd take a picture of them, you know, 60 days later trying to purposely gain body fat and not work out and you know all that stuff and then that would be the before picture and so they'd reverse the pictures and it looks like this crazy transformation i remember learning that and being so well so upset because i got so fooled i mean i bought i, I remember it was time. offered to me mm -hmm. it was offered to me that specifically right yeah it was offered to me five thousand yeah. dollars was offered to me i don't even remember the company it was a company i never even heard of before but these supplement companies would hang out at these bodybuilding events. And, you know, if you were a winner or even top five, because I think when I got approached, I think I took third that time, um, you know, and they'll, they'll uh, solicit these competitors. Now, luckily, I entered that space in my 30s. I had already had built business and had been successful. And so I wasn't in a place of need. But you know, five thousand dollars is a is a decent chunk of money for basically just having to take some pictures and then actually get fat, right? So that's how it works. Mm -hmm. It's like, hey, we would love to offer you five thousand dollars to represent our supplement company. We have these powders, fat loss pills, all these things like that. Um, we would schedule the photo shoot. We would take care of everything. Um, the only thing we actually want you to do is actually put on body fat, and then we're going to take photos afterwards, and that we will use that as it as it's your before picture since you've already done the hard work to get in there. And they sell that to you, and it's really tempting. And if, yeah. if, I, if I was 20 and I needed money at the time, and I guess I didn't have as much integrity, mm -hmm. I'd probably be really tempted, especially if I really needed it. I mean, let's be honest. If you were in a position where like $5,000 is you know, a couple months rent back then for you. Like uh, most I, people who make that their what they want to do are poor. It, mm -hmm. It's not a great way to make money. No, to go right. compete and That's put right. yourself on stage and stuff. That's right. Most people live in an apartment with roommates and they spend all their money on food and training and whatever, who God knows what else. $5,000 to them is a big deal. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, the most misinformation, the most lies comes from the space, but I don't want to just completely demonize it because the truth is the space wouldn't exist without supplements. The first Muscle building magazines, the first fitness magazines were literally put out at first as a way to sell bodybuilding competitions and then as well as, as, as a way to sell supplements. Weeder, not the first supplement company, but the first supplement company to really realize it as a brand, he used his muscle and fitness and later Flex magazine as a way to sell uh, their products. And this is what created the industry. And then I remember when it's, I mean, I could, I'm a huge fan, or should I say, um, I really like spectating and watching this uh, side of the industry. And I remember all the evolutions, you know, went mm -hmm. from there to 
you it, know, yeah, Bill yes. Phillips figuring oh. out how to really, how to make a supplement company, a hundred million dollar supplement company. And then he kind of wrote the book and then they got massive and then supplement companies just exploded and they crushed the market and they, they did, they supported and created uh, the market. Um, and so people have these really false expectations. Although now I think people, a lot of people um, are more privy to the false advertising and the lies, but they're still effective before and afters are still very effective. Even if they look too good to be true, because it seems like it's, it's proof that something's working. I've, I've spent so much money on supplements as a kid, hard earned money, you know, washing dishes at the pizza pizzeria as a, as a 15 year old. And I'd save up my money and buy, you know, when I remember cybergenics, they'd sent me a box of like 15 pill, you know, bottles. I thought, oh, this is going to work because I'm taking so many supplements yeah. and I got diarrhea. It didn't do anything yeah. else to me. <laughs> yeah. You know, as a it result. science images on it. Yeah. You know, work. and uh, so I tried them all. But, you know, that, you know, that being said, there are supplements that um, can have an impact, can move the needle. But I do want to be clear. Uh, they don't compare to good exercise programming. They don't compare to a good diet or good sleep. They do something. Not all of them. Most of them do nothing. Some of them do something, but they don't compare to those things. So I want to be very clear before we get on to the types of supplements that we have found in our experience and the ones that are most supported by science to be the most effective. Today's program giveaway is the MAPS Super Bundle. I think that's like four or five workout programs that you can get for free. Here's how you can win. Leave a comment below this video in the first 24 hours that we drop it. Subscribe to this channel. Turn on notifications. If you do those things, and then if you win, we'll let you know in the comments section. We're also running a sale this month. Maps Symmetry is half off, and the RGB Bundle is half off. If you're interested in either one, just click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, here comes the show. Now, what we did is we actually categorized supplements because there, it, we're going to go down in order of importance and value. And so there are three categories. And the first one is the best supplements for nutrient deficiencies. The second category is just the best for overall fitness, performance, muscle building, fat loss. And then the third category is like weird supplements that actually have been shown to have some effect. Okay. But those are in order of uh, efficaciousness. Okay. So Adam, you mentioned nutrient deficiencies. Mm -hmm. This is a big one. If you have a, a, if you're lacking a key nutrient, your body cannot optim, it cannot operate optimally. And if it gets bad enough, you can actually cause big health problems. Mm -hmm. So this is why this is a big deal. If you don't have any nutrient deficiencies, what we're about to say will do nothing for you. But if you have a nutrient deficiency and you supplement with the right nutrient, it's life-changing. Well, and the reason why it is, is because, and, we'll, and we'll, I'm looking at the list that you made right now, and it's because these can directly impact some of the big rocks. Yes. Hydration, sleep, sleep. recovery, mm -hmm. like hormones. Yeah, hormones. Yeah. A lot of these play a major role in your results. And if you're deficient in that, having supplementing so that your body is optimally running then helps something that your your body naturally is yeah. supposed to do, That's right. which actually supersedes any of these well, performance supplements. Think of it this way. If you have supporting a supporting all the work. Correct. Think of it this way. If you have a nutrient deficiency, you're sick. That's really the best way to describe it. So if you have a genuine nutrient deficiency, your body is sick. So exercise, diet, sleep, the best workout programming, it's like applying those to a sick body. It's, it's, it's going to be very, very tough. And the worse the nutrient deficiency, the bigger the impact uh, when you feel that deficiency. So now, before, you, before you start, I'm looking at your list right now, and I actually don't see something on here, and I'm just curious to why you didn't. Maybe you just missed it, or I want to know why you didn't put it on here, is omega-3s. Yeah. Omega-3s um, typically aren't a deficiency, although people do see benefits from taking them. If you, I'm trying to list the most common deficiencies, yeah, yeah. but omega-3s do have some value. So actually we can add those okay. to the end okay. of Okay, I just thought yeah. maybe I wasn't sure what, there was a purpose. It's right. just not the most commonly like where you test and you know, I don't think there's like a classic, uh, what would be considered deficiency with omega-3s. Um, and it's not as common as the ones that we, that I listed. The mm -hmm. ones I listed are like re widely recognized as one. Yeah. I don't like, disagree with any of the ones yeah. you were. I think those are all, when I think back to clients, like these are the, the big five, yes. that I would say. Yeah. That these are the ones that you'll find, you know, at least a significant minority. Some of these, a majority of people will have a deficiency in. So the first one kind of covers the bases. Okay. That means that, uh, if you don't have a huge nutrient deficiency, this should be enough. Now, if you have a huge nutrient deficiency, you want to target that specific nutrient. But a multivitamin 
a good multivitamin covers kind of all the bases. Fills the gaps. Yeah. yeah. So if you're if your nutrient deficiencies are you know at borderline or slightly below, so you don't have these like really big um, outward symptoms, a good multivitamin will will cover the those for the most part will cover those nutrient deficiencies. So a multivitamin is uh, can be quite valuable to many people, especially if you don't eat a super balanced diet that's you know, high in nutrient dense foods like meat and eggs and fruits and vegetables, then this becomes a little bit more valuable. It also becomes more val valuable if you're dieting or you're, you're in a calorie deficit. What people don't realize is when you cut your calories, you also mm -hmm. can cut your nutrients. Mm -hmm. So a 3000 calorie diet that uh, has a certain amount of nutrients versus the same exact foods, but you're only eating 2000 calories. You've, you've reduced a thousand calories, but you also cut out a third of the nutrients that you normally get. So the lower your calories, typically the the more likely to have nutrient deficiencies, all things being equal. Mm. So multivitamin fills the gaps and tends to make a difference. And the studies in the past were kind of murky on this because there's like a self-selection bias. People who tend to take a multivitamin tend to work out, tend to eat better. But we have better studies now that show that multivitamins uh, definitely can make a difference for most people. Now, in your experience, is there a a type of person that you've noticed the the biggest difference in these? Are there certain questions that you would ask somebody that would lead you to be like, oh, we should probably do this? Or is it a blanket, you know, most people should just take it? The more restricted your diet is, the more likely you would need a multivitamin. Mm. So like if you were following like a very, like a carnivore or Keto, a ketogenic diet vegan, or vegan, vegan diet. Yeah. So, so if you're it, a less diverse diet, more than likely, you should probably definitely be on Yeah, because the nutrients, you know, you're going to have more of certain nutrients in certain types of foods and more of other nutrients in other types of foods. Uh, vegans uh, classically um, have a high rate of nutrient deficiencies. And then if you eat a very high processed food yeah. type of diet, because processed foods uh, are typically high in calories, high in things that make the food palatable, but very low in, in nutrients. Now, That's the problem with that, world. though, is in a, it aren't a lot of processed foods fortified with a bunch they of- They try to, in a lot of them, to make up the difference. Yeah. But, um, I mean, it's not the greatest uh, types of, or, or versions. You know, when you get nutrients from food, you absorb them more mm -hmm. than you would if you get them uh, from supplements or from fortified processed foods. They're just more absorbable. Um, so th there are, like, you could take, for example, iron in 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 meat or liver is going to be much, it's going to be assimilated much better than an iron pill, for example. Well, I've even noticed with certain clients, too, that weren't following a very specific type of a diet, but they just have, like, the, the same food, yes. the same thing all the time. And yeah. they're not rotating vegetables or not rotating meats. Like, so this kind of fills the gaps with people like that that kind of fall into that same kind of pattern. Yeah. Now, Love the it. most common uh, single nutrient deficiency uh, is a toss-up, but it's probably vitamin D, vitamin D3. Over, over magnesium? Over magnesium. It's one of the one of the higher nutrient deficiencies uh, that people will have. And um, it's interesting. The worse the deficiency, the bigger the side effects. I mean, this one can cause depression, anxiety, joint pain. Uh, low testosterone. You yeah, know who so just. You know who a just hormone effect to it. it, it and in fact, some people refer to vitamin D three right. as a hormone. You know who I just discovered they had a deficiency? Mm. My dad. Mm. Now, my dad. The reason why he didn't understand, realize is he's outside all the time. Now, yeah. my dad is dark, so the sun doesn't convert, you know, vitamin D as easily as it would in, like, let's say, Justin, for example, or Doug. Ah. Uh, and he's not outside as much as he he probably should be or his ancestors evolved to be because we're you know from Mediterranean and I have theories around that sure because I this is something that I have I've, I've figured out that I was massively deficient in so massively that I was supplementing with it and I still came tested yeah. back low in it which that blew my mind and I looked scratching my head like that's so weird to me but the biggest difference I can say in in my my life today as adult versus when I was a young as a young kid, I lived outside. Always. Always. Yes. I was in the sun 24-7 yes. all the time. And then it, when I turned 20, I started working bell-to-bell -bell job in these big buildings where I have nothing but fluorescent lights. And I was maybe on the weekends occasionally mm -hmm. out in the sun doing some things like that. But I would say like an, a complete, like if you could say 80% of my childhood was in the sun, 20% was in closed doors, that did a complete flip. I went to like... 80% of my life indoors, maybe at best 20%. So I have this a theory that 
my body adapted to the little high levels of getting vitamin D naturally, like through the sun and stuff. And then it went, then I went later in my life and completely neglected it. And so I, it, it the caused a greater the darker. Your, your skin is naturally the more sun exposure you get to create the same amount of vitamin D. So you'll see vitamin D deficiencies will be higher in people with darker skin Oh, because we evolved. I say weeks. I'm dark too. We evolved being outside all the time. So like my dad, my dad literally every day he's outside for at least a couple hours. So we can handle higher levels versus like someone like Justin, like just a little bit of sun and he's going to take up all of it because he, his body's going to convert more. Uh, so like, like I said, my dad, I mean, we're Sicilian and our, when we did our genetic testing, like people are, are some of our ancestors came from the middle East. Um, and so, you know, so if we don't get like all day sun, then this is something we need to supplement with. Hmm. Um, now, you know what his symptoms were? He had anxiety and joint pain. And now he's older, so he thought he was just getting older. Mm -hmm. Went to the doctor for a checkup. Their vitamin D's low. Took vitamin D. Within a week, joint pain's gone. Mm -hmm. He's wow. like, I can't believe it made that big of a difference. Mm -hmm. um, people who live, uh, historically, people who lived in uh, cold, uh, darker climates. Yeah, Northern Euro European. Northern people. Europeans. They would consume, naturally consume foods. I don't even think they realized. It was just old wisdom that contained high levels of vitamin D, like cod yep. liver. Yep. Cod liver it contains a high levels of really of bioavailable vitamin D. And this is what they would consume in the winter to prevent, you know, winter illness or whatever they now, would was call it, it. What was the deficiency, like the extreme version of the deficiency? Rickets. Was it rickets? rickets. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, That's rickets. What I thought. So vitamin D3, some estimates, 30%, some as high as 70% uh, of the population probably too low vitamin D. We're just indoors all the time. Okay, so that's your right. That's why I was curious because the next yeah. one is magnesium. Magnesium And also. magnesium is 60%. Yeah. I've read that before because that was, I mean, yeah. I remember when I was so blown away by, again, it's so funny this out. This is literally how skeptical I am of supplements is like I take a supplement I like feel like, oh my God, this is game changer for me. It. I still question it and I got to dive into like, what is it that yeah. is making me feel this way? Yeah. Lo and behold, I have a major deficiency in magnesium and it's not that the Hello Ned was freaking making me so, you know, like this a miracle supplement for sleep. Yeah. It's that I was so deficient in it. It's high in magnesium and the right kind that's like, and that made the biggest difference in my yes. sleep. Lack of magnesium can cause uh, sleep issues, anxiety, weakness, fatigue. This one's very common. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the reasons why magnesium uh, deficiencies are common is the the, the foods that we eat are have lower levels of magnesium than they used to. Because of the way that we grow food. The soil, right? Yeah, the so soil is far less dense. Yeah, less nutrient dense. dense. Yeah, because what we've learned, we figured out how to replace um, the components in, in, in soil that allow it to grow food, but we don't replace everything. So it's like, you know, just put this in there, now we can grow plants. But now the plants and foods have lower levels uh, of, of magnesium. So this is a common one. And supplementing with magnesium, by the way, not all magnesium is created equal. Uh, magnesium glycinate is typically more bioavailable. Magnesium three and eight uh, seems to be better for the brain. And then there's like magnesium citronate, which you don't really absorb very well, but acts more like a laxative. Um, so in some people we use it in that way. So not all forms uh, are the same, but this is one of the more common nutrient deficiencies. I should have known better because this is the same with like, like plants. Like pl I've told you guys before, what, what made me so fascinated with marijuana was that in plants, it's certain in, types. It's NPK, right? So your nitrogen, phosphorogen, and what's K? So you have, uh, potassium. 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 Yes, thank you. Are the three main like macronutrients? So it's like it's like very similar to like proteins, carbs, and yeah, fats yeah. for the human body. And then your ones that like if the plant is deficient, a lot of times it'll show itself in its leaf coloring or the way it's mm -hmm. withering or curling. Magnesium is like one of the number one things that it's deficient in, and you supplement it. There's so many parallels to like feeding a plant a balanced diet of NPK like that, just like it is protein, carbs, fat. And if you're not, all these other levels are That's thrown wild. off and the plant expresses it. It's That's just wild. that it's so obvious in a plant where sometimes for us, it's not as obvious for people to pick up on it. You yeah, know? That's wild. All right, so this next one isn't really an issue if you eat the standard American diet, you don't work out. You, you, this is probably not an issue for you because you probably get plenty of sodium in your processed food diet. But- among people who are fitness and health oriented, who avoid heavily processed foods, who eat whole natural foods, who sweat regularly because they work out, or people who work outside a lot, construction workers and roofers, and who also are health conscious, who sweat quite a bit. Sodium is a makes a big deal in most people when they bump their sodium intake if they eat a whole natural food diet and they work out a lot. Like this is so big that 
I know eight out of 10 people that I recommend this to are going to come back to me and report that they saw a, a big difference. Well, this is huge in our community. Like, so if you're right. listening to this podcast, I actually think this is one of the big ones. That's why I put it because there. you're a health and fitness person. If I'm talking to a, you know, a, friend of the family or family and some family members that are not into health and fitness. Them, so. not, I'm not even worried about this because of how much sodium is loaded in processed food. Right. But if you're a health conscious person and you would consider yourself somebody who eats mostly whole foods, this is actually like one of the first go-to things totally. that I end up recommending that ends up making a huge difference. And a lot of that has to do with how much we demonized yes, salt for so long that, yeah. that if you are a health conscious person, one of the things you right away do is like, oh, I should also reduce my salt. And you're mm -hmm. like, oh shit, if you went from processed foods, eating whole foods, and then you're also trying not to mm -hmm. salt your food, you're almost certainly yeah, You low. pretty much just eliminate it out of your diet. Yeah. And that's just going to cause a whole nother host of problems for you. Yeah, so. even if you salt your food, it's yeah. probably- it's Still probably, not a lot. No, it's no. probably still not Especially in comparison to processed. That's it's right. not even in the same universe. That's right. If you eat low carb, you need even more. Low carbs it sucks the salt and water out of your body. In yep. fact, the whole keto flu is probably most likely due to uh, an electrolyte imbalance. So people like all of a sudden drop their carbs. Like, oh, I feel like garbage for a sure. week. I got to adjust. You just throw some sodium and some water, you know, electrolyte powder would do it. And, you know, Element is a company we work with. They have a good product and you'll probably f feel better with the next 10 minutes. It's pretty, uh, pretty profound. Um, by the way, the symptoms of uh, not having enough sodium, muscle cramps, fatigue, low grade, constant Brain kind of headaches. Fog, yeah. Yeah, like bad, like you don't get good pumps or you feel flat in the gym um, and just reduced athletic performance. All right, this next one is also quite common and especially common in vegans, and that's the B vitamins in general, but B12 in particular. Low B12, your energy is gone and you can develop anemia. You can actually have good iron levels, but B12 is so low that you're anemic and feel like death. I've worked with people like this where they... They, everything looked good. Everything, like their diet, everything was fine. Then they went and, by the way, you could have a B12 deficiency because you have gut problems. You're not absorbing enough B12 in your diet. I had a client once who got mm. a shot of B12 and she's like, within 15 minutes, I felt like a completely different person. So I think this one highlights, again, what we, we've talked about many times, which is just how many people under consume protein. I think that yeah, you'll get that in your meat. That right? was the correlation that yeah. I found with this was that. You know, if I had a client who thought they they ate pro, you know, because they had one meal or they had four ounces of meat in the day of pro, they just were not getting enough B vitamins, and so it's obviously found a lot in red meat. And so if you're if you don't hit your protein intake uh, consistently, this is also one of the most. And of course, if you're vegan, right? Vegan is number one. If I yeah. had a vegan client that we almost always would probably have to supplement with this for sure. And then even if I just had like a normal client who was under consuming protein, especially like red meats, uh, this was also a super common. I one. always had my vegan clients take uh, B vitamins and sometimes iron, oftentimes iron and vitamin D always because the vitamin D ver um, form you'll get in vegan sources is not D3, it's called D2. And it's not nearly as um, bioavailable or as useful. The iron you get from plant sources, same thing. And then B vitamins are pretty much non-existent. So I would always, when I get a vegan client, I'd have them take these supplements. And I would say probably 70% of them noticed a, a pretty profound difference. All right, the next category are the best overall supplements for fitness that aren't necessarily filling nutrient deficiencies. Uh, now, um, sh no shocker to us, but maybe to you, there's only this two. This is a short list. There's only <laughs> two <laughs> yeah, yeah. in this category. I like this though, because this, I mean, this is so true to like, when I think back to the two things I have used the most or spent the most money on right. in my entire career, these are the two. Yeah. That's right. right. Right here. So the first one, which I will label the king of all supplements, because besides again, nutrient deficiency filling supplements, because it's the one that has the most studies. It's the one that has been shown to be safe unequivocally across the board. It's also the one that contributes to not just muscle gain and fat loss and athletic performance. Cognitive. But now we know, now we see that it it's good for the brain. Mm -hmm. It's good for the heart. It's good for the liver. It may actually be anti-cancer. There's some studies now that I are I feel like they're going to keep finding things about it. This is a longevity supplement, not just a fitness supplement. And I went from saying... Hey, creatine's a great supplement, take it or not, to everybody should probably take it. So creatine, king of all supplements. Creatine monohydrate, that's the form that you take, five grams a day. Uh, it's This one for me was a game changer when I first took it. Not because creatine 
blew my mind with the muscle gains, but because it did something. Like I took yeah. so many things before it. It was the first supplement I felt. That's it. Yeah. That's a hundred percent what happened to me. I took yeah. so many supplements, didn't notice anything. And then I took this, I remember I bought, you know, it was, uh, uh EAS sold it and I, it was expensive by the way. It was like a 20 day supply for $45. This was back in 1995, I want to say. So like now you could buy a thousand, like you could buy a huge tub of it for oh, yeah. that much. The irony of this is these two are like some of the cheapest Yes. supplements that you can buy and so to that point in, on both of these you're for, and this is what happens in this space is if it is universally the best and every supplement company knows it's the best well then it becomes highly competitive so then what do they do they like try to, they try and market it in a way or change something our about version it is better that's right they'll yeah. change one thing about it like how it's made or processed, or what yeah. is added to Creating it, or, citrate, or and, yeah. yes, and then they what they what they have to do is then put a lot of energy and effort into talking about the thing that's different about theirs to convince you to spend the extra three to five dollars per bottle on it than going somewhere where it'd be less expensive. There is no version of creatine better than creatine monohydrate. That's the one that's studied, and so what you run the risk of by going with other forms of creatine is actually getting a worse form or one that might have some negative effects because of what it's attached to or, yeah. or how they made it. Creatine monohydrate, that's it, period, end of story. That's the creatine you want to buy. It's also the least expensive. But yeah, I remember taking it and uh, my strength, after a week, I added five to 10 pounds on my lifts. And, you know, I was a 16-year-old, no, maybe even younger, 15 or 16-year-old kid. And it blew my mind. Yeah, I mind. could get that last rep, no yeah. problem. Yep. It, was, it definitely was mind-blowing yeah. that it worked. So, so that's, that's at the top. Now, second, also very valuable, Protein powder. Now, why is protein powder valuable? Because it's hard to hit protein targets. We know if you eat about a gram of protein per pound of target body weight, you're going to get better results than if you eat less than that. It's hard to do it with whole natural food. Like protein is hard to eat because it's satiating. It's hard to get and prepare. Even if you're light, even if you're a 120 pound female, go eat 120 grams of protein a day and you'll see how hard it is. It's not like fat and carbs which are easy to eat, protein is yeah. is hard to hit. Well, hands down, it's the it's the most missed macronutrient ever that I've seen in, consistently across yeah. the board in all clients. In fact, you could argue that this could go in the other category because if you are somebody who is yeah. is deficient in protein chronically, like under eating like that, supplementing for that is a, is a big deal. I mean, mm -hmm. I, how many times have you had clients like that that were – only the female clients eating 20 to 30 grams oh, no. in a day and it's and they're having hair loss or they're yeah. having issue. Like, I mean, just there is definitely a case to be made that this could also fall in the category of deficiencies on some people. So uh, this one definitely is right up there with creatine as like the ultimate, you know, best for fitness, but then also an area where a lot of people tend to miss. Now, that being said, you've heard it on a, a, here a, many times from us. I'm always using this like like creatine, like you take every day, no matter what. Yeah. Right. Uh, but with protein, my goal is to get it through whole foods. Mm -hmm. And then I keep the bars or shakes as a thing to check in with myself at the end of the day. That's it. And go, oh man, I've already ate everything. I'm I'm pretty full. I don't want to, or I don't, it's eight o'clock at night. I want to go make another big meal in the kitchen. Um, and I'm I'm shy 40 grams of protein for my day to hit my bare minimum of what I need to. I'm going to use my shake. That's it's, how I'm using it's it. It's an insurance policy. That's how I look at protein. Yes. It's my just it's my in case bottle and when I track the, my whole day, I end the day and I go, "Oh, I'm off by 30 or 40 grams." By the way, I don't like people taking more than let's say a serving or two, depending on how much protein. If you eat a lot of protein, you're a big guy, you you might need two servings of protein. But I don't like people taking a lot of servings of protein powder because you miss out on the satiety benefits, the nutrient benefits and some of the digestive benefits of eating whole natural foods. Nothing beats whole natural foods. If you can eat your protein target with whole natural foods, then don't worry about protein powder. I just know through training people, that's a hard thing to do. And unless you're a fitness fanatic and really pay attention, you're probably not eating enough protein, in which case protein powders make a big difference. Yeah, and it's going to take a little bit of work too to kind of, uh, there's there's various versions of protein that, that will, you'll be able to digest effectively and, and assimilate. You so, yeah. um, you know, there's no like specific one we're recommending because everybody has individual needs and, you know, uh, it, it, they're going to receive it differently. So there's vegan sources, there's, you know, there's whey, there's, there's all these other different sources and collagen and whatnot. So you just have to kind of work your way through that if it works uh, best for your body. I like that. You, I'm so glad you said that, Justin. Uh, the number one thing to consider with a protein powder in the context of you actually hitting your protein targets is digestibility. 
you're going to see a lot of companies advertise their protein powder as the most bioavailable, the highest in branched chain amino acids or essential amino acids, the most anabolic. That only is true when your protein intake is low. So if you're missing your targets, then whey protein is going to beat the crap out of, let's say, collagen protein. But if you're hitting your targets, it doesn't matter. And the studies show this. You have plenty of amino acids from because you're eating so much protein. It doesn't matter. So, And if you use protein the way we say it, which is to hit your target, then its digestibility is what you need to consider. And it doesn't matter. Nothing, none of the other, nothing matters in terms of the source except for the fact that I digest this the best and that makes me feel the best. All right, last category. I saved this one for last because these, the these are the least important. <laughs> <I> like <laughs> they're you, the fun ones. I like yeah. how you labeled it. Yeah, the these are the best weird supplements for fitness. <laughs> and I said the weird because they're exotic or they're herbs or there's some kind of plant extract. Now, I included this, the, the compounds in here that have the best data or the best experience. Okay. I, I said, or because, um, studies aren't perfect and I, I am going to anticipate that some of the ones that, that I listed in here that might not have tons of studies, they have some, but not tons will eventually have the studies uh, to support them. Really. It's only one category that's like that. So these are the ones with the best data and, or the best track work record in terms of experience. Now, the first one though, that you're going to, you're going to list off, which is ashwagandha is across the board been researched. And great is, data. Is yeah, great data. some of the best data as far as like yeah. it being beneficial. Ashwagandha is great for helping the body deal with stress. Okay. Well, what's important with that? Do I just feel relaxed? Well, yeah, but that's not really it. It literally enhances the adaptation process. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if you're trying to build muscle or burn body fat or improve your yeah. athletic performance, you, you are stressing your body. That's what's triggering those changes. And so ashwagandha enhances the adaptation process. It's been used for thousands of years in Ayurvedic medicine. So it has a long track record. And we now have studies to show that it does in fact do those things. It does help boost strength. It does help with fat loss and it does raise testosterone in men with low testosterone. Now this would, this would be considered the number one adaptogen on the market, correct? But with the most data, for sure. And and explain the you've done it before, but just for people that might be listening to this episode for the first time, I, I love your dimmer switch example of like trying to explain what an adaptogen is doing in our yeah. body. Yeah. So adaptogens, it, you, your your body's ability to deal with stress uh, really it has to be balanced in order for your body to adapt really well. And so uh, adaptogens allow your body to handle more stress and adapt better to the stress. Meaning if you're you know, not getting the best sleep and you're, you're working really hard um, and you're working out, uh, taking ashwagandha will improve your body's ability to deal with all that. So rather than having to cut your workouts in half and, you know, really look at your, your stress levels, you could take ashwagandha and it could make the difference between whether or not you get stronger or whether or not you're overtrained or fried as a result. I recommend ashwagandha. I used to recommend it to um, moms and dads of new kids who were just getting poor sleep. And I'd say, all right, here, try this and see how it works. You also had me taking it when I was years ago trying to naturally kick yeah. up my testosterone levels. Yeah. Like where where is it playing a role with something like that? They're not quite sure how it works, like, but it's traditionally was used in Ayurvedic medicine for libido uh, uh, in men. And uh, they know why it works or how it does that. It does. So if you have low testosterone, ashwagandha will reliably raise your testosterone about, about 20%. It's not this huge, crazy, oh my God, I tripled my testosterone boost. Um, and I don't think that's where the muscle gains come from. It's not a big enough boost. No, yourself, but I, you'll I, feel it. And I don't, I think for somebody who is a young teenager who's trying to build muscle, that's not the way you sell this. It's no. to a guy like me who was in his 40 at the, or close to at the time and is <clears throat> coming is low testosterone. Yeah. yeah. Um, that person would feel the difference. Now, the, the, to the young person, I would give ashwagandha like this. I would say, um, this is going to allow you to train harder. It's going to allow you to get away with more practices. Uh, with Burning the candle at both That's ends. That's right. So if you're an athlete, if you're a young athlete, you're constantly juggling overtraining. You always know, you know this, right? Oh, I'm too sore. I'm too stiff. And, oh, you know, coach is pushing me too hard. Ashwagandha, it's like, it's going to basically allow you to recover faster and adapt better to that stress. All right, this next one, here's the only, this is the only one it's got, there's studies that support it, but they're not the best studies and there's not a ton of them yet. I say yet because my experience with both myself and every single person who I've ever had try this and in combination with old Soviet studies supports the use of uh, terkesterone or ectisterone, which essentially are compounds that contain what are called ectisteroids. These are plant 
hormones or insect hormones, literally, but they get them from plants. But insects contain these as a hormone. And uh, the Soviet studies were remarkable. Now, there's quite there, there, lots of people like to question these Soviet studies, but based on my experience, I think they're legit. They actually compared ecdysterone to five or 10 milligrams a day of Dianabol. For those people who don't know what that is, Dianabol is an anabolic steroid. It's 10, five to 10 milligrams a day is not a huge dose. Bodybuilders mm -hmm. go way higher than that, okay? But you give the average person 10 milligrams a day of Dianabol, they're going to feel it. They're going to gain five to seven pounds of muscle. Their strength's going to go up maybe 15, 20 pounds on some big lifts. They're going to get a little leaner. So the average person will notice this. Bodybuilders in the 50s, uh, 40s and 50s would take about five to 10 milligrams of Dianabol. So if you want to look at what genetically gifted bodybuilders who took a little bit of Dianabol look like, look at pictures of people like Larry Scott, the first Mr. Olympia. That So he's a genetically gifted bodybuilder because they all are. Plus, he took about 10 milligrams a day of D-ball. So that's what they look like. Tocesterone and ecdysterone in these Soviet studies performed outperformed them. They actually, uh, the people in the studies- Outperformed just from, yeah. spideroids. Huh? Yeah, yeah, built a little bit more muscle and strength. And at had, the lower dose, though, right? That's what you're- Five calling. to 10 milligrams of D-ball. Okay. Diana, I mean, body, actually, bodybuilders don't take that much. They no. only take more than that, I should say. Than, than but they only to, so I, I'm trying to remember. I think I think because uh, I messed around with D ball probably for 25, little, 25 50, milligrams. Yeah. yeah, 25 on top of other stuff. Oh yeah, of course. Nobody just does these days. But I mean, I'll, for the audience that has no idea what that feels like, like uh, 25 to 50 milligrams of D ball was crazy. Yeah, like I'm I, I yeah within three two weeks I actually came off of sure. D ball because I was embarrassed of how big my shoulders were. <laughs> yeah. like, that's a real that's a true story. Like this was me in my 20s. Uh, I wasn't openly discussing or telling people that I was taking steroids and it was blowing my shoulders up so fast. I was like, I, I every, and every shoulder workout, I remember like stacking on like a lot of weight. And I remember I got to a point, I'll never forget. I was standing like this and I saw my own reflection and it had basketballs on my shoulders. And I was like <laughs> embarrassed. I was like, oh my God, everybody's going to know. Seen yeah, you like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Trip. yeah, yeah everybody's going to know. Everybody's <laughs> going to know. <laughs> I wouldn't have been embarrassed. That, 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 cool. Yeah. Let's keep going. I mean, of course, there's a party that's cool, but it was that obvious that, you know, I was going to have to tell people yeah. I'm taking steroids because they're going to ask because it was like this such a Now, for difference. people listening right now, there's a big difference between five to 10 milligrams of Dianabol well, it's and five 25 times. milligrams. I mean, that's five yeah. times the difference. Yeah. So, but like I said, uh, it's still something people would feel. And like I said, bodybuilders in the 40s, 50s, this is what they took. Uh, Olympic athletes in the 40s took this to compete in the 50s com to compete with the so Soviets. a window, right? Yeah. Of effectiveness. Yes. Yeah, so, so I'll get there, right? Okay. So, but, but the studies show that it's as effective. I've used uh, ecdysterone and turkesterone, uh, you know, on and off for I don't know ten years, and uh, it's you feel it, you really do. I get stronger, I build more muscle. It'll put about seven pounds of lean body mass on me. My your appetite goes up. You you sleep hard. You get really weird, vivid dreams, which is a strange uh, side effect. Libido tends to go up on it. But the window of effect is about 45 to 60 days. After that, it stops doing anything. Oh, interesting. And uh, I don't know how it affects women necessarily because they are starting to think that it, the way that it works is through the estrogen receptor, which is strange. Which can't be good. Well, I mean, it, so here's the deal. Uh, it improves cholesterol profile. It's been shown to be good for the liver. It boosts <laughs> the immune system. So it's actually like a good for you supplement as well, which they showed in the Soviet study, but they also show now. Interesting. Here's the problem. Good luck finding real turkesterone, ecdysterone. A lot of supplement companies out there saying they have it. It's expensive. It's hard to get. Mm. But if you find the real stuff, you know. Uh, in fact, I found some real stuff and we'll see later on if we end up working with this company. So I'm not going to mention them yet because I haven't vetted them completely. But I had the editors uh, take it. And I'm like, let's see if this is real. And I told him. You know, <laughs> That's actually it. you to guinea pig them. <laughs> <laughs> you know? He's like, so nice I'm not sure have... if it's real or yeah. not. Oh, yeah. So I give it to my employees. No, 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 hold on. Let me, <laughs> experiment let me be clear. Do you think I didn't take it either? Yeah. I had all of us take it. Because yeah, I'm like, let's yeah. see what happens. Well, yeah. sure enough, they all hit PRs. Good. Everybody hit PRs. Everybody noticed their appetite go up. Everybody knows they slept better. Yeah. Interesting. So it's it's legit. It's legit stuff. It's more of the, on the hardcore end, but there's a window. And when you go off, you do notice a little bit of a dip for a couple of weeks before you come back up okay. to, to okay. normal. Next one. Next one is cordyceps. Cordyceps is weird because this is a fungus that takes over insects and acts yeah, like a zombie. Makes them zombies. Yeah. So yeah. the Chinese have used cordyceps for a long time. Um, it does improve stamina and endurance. Studies will show this. It's also anti-cancer, antioxidant, and it's healthy for you. Uh, but when it comes to stamina and endurance, you feel this for sure. I don't notice it as much with strength training 
unless I'm doing short rest supersets. When I did jujitsu, this was crazy. It was like, I'd take it. And within a week, I was like, my stamina was like significantly better. Well, isn't there yeah. a famous story of the women's Olympic swim, Chinese team? swim team? Oh, it was a Chinese swim team? Who knows if they were, this is really what happened. But they were winning and they're like, oh, it's cordyceps. Maybe they were taking some yeah. other stuff. It's oh, like, I they thought they tried to, to ban them something. because they were taking that. No, thought, cordyceps oh. is legal. It's still legal. Uh, so you could take it. Yeah, no, I know it's still legal, but I thought that that- They were making a deal about it. They were making a deal about it because the it The Chinese makes, coaches said it was cordyceps. Uh, but who knows? It might have been just them being like, yeah, it's not- some undetectable hormone that we just invented. Doesn't this also have some benefits with your uh, your tolerance for like sauna and heat? Too? Yes, yes. Now that I noticed, and that's other people have noticed, I don't know if there's any data to support this, that may be where the stamina comes from. The fact that you don't overheat as much. Uh, I'm wondering if that's where it comes from. Because I notice I can go in the sauna forever when I'm yeah. on cordyceps. There's some crazy studies about that. Core temperature studies where that, remember that you put the uh, glove that oh, was like yeah. cooled down yeah. like in between uh, bouts and, it, and your recovery time was like in half. So, yeah, pretty yeah. crazy. Lastly, this is a famous, another famous Soviet uh, herb, uh, era herb. They actually gave this to their soldiers. Um, and, uh, there's some crazy studies on rhodiola. They'll take my rats and they'll have them swim until they drown. Uh, so basically like <laughs> max exertion, I know messed up, right? Yeah. But rhodiola significantly increases the amount of time, you know, animals can swim until they drown. Um, in athletes, this improves stamina, endurance. It's got some mild stimulatory effects. It's also acts as an adaptogen. Some people, if they use the recommended dose, uh, start to feel a little bogged down or overheated. That happens to me. But if I use a lower than normal dose, I, I, this definitely makes a big impact. What was, I remember we talked about that study a long time ago. If in, in, if you remember, I want to hear what it was because I remember it was like a like a crazy amount. Like it was, again, I'm, you correct me if I'm wrong here, but it was like the, the, the mice were thrown in a bucket with no cordyceps or no rhodiola. They, you know, basically after a couple minutes, they drown. The ones that were given it was like 10 times yeah. longer or something. It was yeah. like a, a ridiculous amount longer. It wasn't like a, oh, they're no. 30 seconds longer and then they drown. No. It was like they were able to sustain. That's why the study, the Soviets studied this because they, because they're like, if we go in this long drawn out, remember the Soviets, this was after World War II where they're just, it was a crazy war. And they mm -hmm. said, oh, our soldiers can survive longer in cold weather, no food, no sleep. Like it's, it's, uh, you know, and, and just being out there with needing crazy stamina. That's why they invested so much time and money in rhodiola. Rhodiola has got a lot of studies that support it. Um, and it actually works. I personally use rhodiola as a way to come off caffeine. Okay. Mm. So coming off caffeine. That's what's in the red, is that in red juice? Correct. Okay. That's part that also has cordyceps. Uh, the, the Organifi red juice has both, but, uh, rhodiola for me helps me with caffeine withdrawal. Otherwise it's, it's terrible. Um, because I noticed it gives me a little bit of energy, a little bit of stimulant effect, and I don't feel like I'm, you know, brain dead because my caffeine intake is is down to zero. Hmm. So there you have it. Those are the best supplements in each of the categories that we listed. If you like our show and you want more free stuff from us, we have a lot, go to mindpumpfree.com, check out all of our fitness guides. We have guides that can help you with all kinds of fitness goals, everything from building muscle to burning body fat to improving longevity. You can also find all of us on social media. Justin is on Instagram at mindpumpjustin. I'm on Instagram at Mind Pump to Stefano, and Adam is on Instagram at Mind Pump Adam.